here and thank you everybody for being a uh, thank you for being here Good morning, everyone. I wanted to introduce Peter Bajo, a professor at Sonoma State University. He's really well educated in his profession and we're really happy to have him here this morning. So we'll give the floor over to Peter. Well, good morning. And uh, what an honor to be able to address uh, Humanidad. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Anya Maria, Sitali, Barbara. Please, if there is um, challenges that emerge with the pacing of my presentation due to the translation, uh, some kind of signaling for uh, one example could be, for example, Sitali or someone I can see to, to kind of go a hand gesture inviting me to perhaps slow the pace will be something that I can respond to in real time. I would have mentioned this to Barbara, but I just see the uh, beautiful flag on her, uh, on her screen. So I, I, I don't know that I could pick up a hand gesture from her, but if possible, you know, help me out uh, if the pacing gets too fast. It is predicated on the speed that I am accustomed to presenting the slides. So we'll just work with the tools that we have. Again, I want to open with uh, my distinct appreciation for being included with Humanidad, especially when I see the uh, insignia and logo uh, behind Sitali and uh, Emily, because it reminds me of the incredible history that we enjoy here in California over the centuries of interaction with uh, uh, Hispanic, and I guess nowadays we refer to it as Latinx community uh, here in California. Uh, what a distinct privilege to be part of that here today. Insofar as my presentation is concerned, I'm going to go ahead and share screen so that we can view the slide that I have uh, prepared. Okay, so when I hit share screen, it's not a lot. Oh, that's probably because I'm a guest. Do we, uh, so if you, you have to uh, list me as a participant for me to call up my uh, slides. I go through this with my own guests in my own class, so I'm familiar with it. You're the co-host now, okay. So let's, um, we'll try this again. Perfect, okay, share screen. And I'm going to migrate to my slides, prepared here and I'm gonna then have to remove our images. There we go. Okay. Bueno. Okay, good. Well, welcome. And uh, I must say I'm flattered at the interest in somatic psychology, um, uh, mostly because um, I have found that it's, the area is um, underrepresented and uh, generates low recognition of its value within uh, the field of mental health. And subsequently, uh, I feel uh, privileged that uh, you, Anna Maria, might think to add this to your uh, offerings uh, through Humanida. Um, in so far, for those who may not be familiar, somatic psychology, which involves reflexes, involves navigating the traffic between nerves from the outer part of the body that go into the spinal cord 
and then back. And it's learning how to uh, access and modulate these signals that your body sends involving pain, discomfort, and functional imbalance. And then utilizing the mind-body relationship to help moderate the symptoms that can emerge from nervous system imbalance. Okay, my, uh, my functioning is reflecting a new admittance. Pardon the, uh, I may have to uh, reshuffle, but let's see if I can clear this up. Okay, it looks like in order to advance, oh, there we go, okay. So, uh, this traffic from nerves to outer functioning and back often involves muscles. Nerve signals that contain electrochemical messages uh, in the long run over time involve patterns of ongoing muscle contraction or squeezing. And this traffic between nerves and muscles takes place between muscles, organs, and um, skin to the spinal cord and then back again, very much like a two lane highway signaling going the end, it's subdivided. The somatic refers specifically to muscles and the autonomic refers to internal organs. They operate jointly. So if you peel back the layers of the spinal cord, you can locate the inner parts that receive and process incoming impulses from the outer world and then subsequently functions are executed through motor commands when we want to steer functioning. The center of the spinal cord you see in close up here is depicted in this particular slide as orange. And it's normally referred to as the gray matter. And the surrounding tan area is normally referred to as the white matter. This is all at the center of the spinal cord. What you see in green are what look like wires coming in to the top and wires coming out of the bottom. And that is the basic construct of sensory on the top and motor on the bottom. And this processing of this two lane traffic, again, takes place in the gray matter at the center of the spinal cord. There you can see the traffic coming in at the top of the slide, the traffic going out at the bottom of the slide. And when taken together, 
this is referred to as neuromuscular reflexive arc. Arc because it resembles a curve in summary, starting at the blue on the left, signals or impulses entering the spinal cord through sensory feeling on the top, curving around the middle of the spinal cord and then exiting out the bottom in red. The exiting out of the bottom part of the arc is, are the motor commands. Our entire system of movement is based on sensory motor together and they are responsible, those impulses, those electric signals are responsible for controlling what we call the action reflex. So in, in summary, incoming signals called afferent coming in from the sensory apparatus, could be the skin or the internal organs, form the sensory apparatus. And then in the reflex arc, those impulses are immediately categorized uh, and action takes place through the motor part of the activating reflex and the motor portion is referred to as efferent. So you have sensory afferent impulses arcing across the spinal cord, resulting in motor efferent impulses, and those lead directly into muscles. For the most part, they signal contraction. And this pathway, when taken together, is referred to as stimulus slash response. The stimulus being the, sen the uh, sensory, the motor, the muscles. And this is the basis of sensory slash motor reflex loop. And that transmits incoming signals from the receptors on the periphery of the body to the effector muscle or the muscle that's used to initiate whatever particular action is being initiated to the effector muscle, sensory motor. And this sensory stimulation is linked to the motor response by the interneurons. And that's a relay or connection neuron that allows communication between the sensory and the motor neurons. It functions as a cohesive, unified response. But those are the two branches, sensory and motor. And as it turns out, People that I see in my clinical practice often are suffering from tension buildup, which in many cases reflects ongoing signaling of muscle fibers to remain in a state of contraction, even after muscle movements have been completed. That is the basis of tension build up and the component that tension build up provides symptom health healthcare symptom generation the nerve impulse that signals muscle fibers to remain in a continuous state of contraction 
has literally, in the cases of chronic muscle tension, become a reflex. Squeezing has become reflexive, which means automatic. It happens automatically. When, and it's the automatic default, just like your computer defaults into a saving screen, it's the defaulting of impulses into habitual contraction that accounts for what we call generalized reflex arcs, meaning they don't have to have a particular stimulation to maintain contraction over long periods of time. In, and <clears throat> that's uh, under can be accounted for when one takes into consideration that in higher animals, most sensory neurons do not pass directly into the brain itself, but instead they synapse into the spinal cord. You know, synapse, synaptic traffic, synapse refers to the sending of those electrochemical signals, essentially electric signals along the nerve fibers, snapping back across the center of the spinal cord and resulting in muscular contraction in an instant, in an eye blink. In higher animals, most sensory neurons synapse across the spinal cord and allow reflexive movements. For example, walking is an example of a reflexive movement, meaning that you don't have to say to the muscle, if you had to account for each muscle contraction, the slowing down would be prohibitive in terms of action. Instead, the movement of the muscles becomes a reflex. Action reflexes are fundamental mechanisms that allow complex tasks to be performed without requiring full frontal attention. Ultimately, that allows your attention and mine to be placed somewhere else. And our general orientation to our outer world is shaped by reflexes, many of which are all but invisible to us. This begins with the pupillary light reflex arc. And that causes our pupils to constrict or get smaller in response to light. So these reflexes are happening at the very core of our interaction with our outer world. This continues as we develop into the crawl reflex, which is our initial means of transportation and investigation as we develop of the outer world. Crawling is reflexive. We don't have to command the muscles to go one, two, three, four, or A, B, C, D. The muscles do it without, without synapsing up the spinal cord to the brain. The point being that reflexes are fundamental, but they're unnoticed as a series of operations whose mechanism are designed to take place underneath our awareness. I'll show you an example of that anatomically. 
And the same is also true of the yawn reflex. There's a built-in reason why our reflexes pass largely unnoticed by us. And that's because the various reflexive operations are conducted by way of the spinal cord. And that means that the brain isn't always fully aware of the activities taking place beneath its domain of awareness. So you see the part of the brain that specialized for frontal attention is the outer part, the frontal part of the cortex. But the reflexes are being processed along the brain stem underneath the cortex. And that means the front of us or the part of us that identifies with attention cannot always account for why reflexive behaviors are taking place. It's because it amounts to a back channel of functioning inside of us, like a back door. When you think of it, it's not remotely practical at all for the focus of our frontal attention to be occupied with the multitude of operations that the body is required to perform in order to remain functioning. This is an example, one of which would be the heart beating. If our frontal awareness was taken up by commanding our heart to beat, we wouldn't have time to focus on other things that would take up the most of it. So with all the functions required to maintain the body's functioning, the attentional overload would be overwhelming if we had to attend to each one of them individually. So therefore, reflexes are conducted along the nerves to the spinal cord from the muscles or the organs and then back in and then out. And the nerves connect with each area of the spinal cord. And each area is specialized for conducting specified actions, specific actions. And the nerves emerging from the different spinal cord regions connect directly with particular organ functions as you can see summarized here. You can see that the heart comes from a certain part of the spine, the stomach comes from a different part of the spine, the eyes, the mouth, and then you know the different organs all have specialty areas that connect with this wiring system for each one of their individual function. Chronic muscle tension occurs when muscles remain contracted or squeezed beyond the point when they're being used for a specific task. And when a muscle becomes overstimulated by trauma or overuse, the resulting shortening and contractions are not followed by relaxation. The muscle remains contracted and not able to lengthen the way it needs to to achieve balance. That's what goes on to produce headaches, teeth grinding, and other, including tinnitus, inner ringing of the inner ear, and various other tension-related health disorders. This onslaught or barrage of neural activity, nervous system activity, originating in what's referred to as 
the spastic muscle, one that remains in contraction, spastic, ends up layering on itself because it doesn't let go. And the layering results in a second layer of contraction, further stimulation by the central nervous system. And that increases the spasming over time. Anything that's chronic takes place over time. It cycles around, doesn't end. And that prevents muscles from returning to a lengthened state. And this feedback loop is called, when it happens, and cycles without release, a hyperactive reflex arc, where nerve impulses from the spastic muscle stimulates the central nervous system. And then the central nervous system responds to that stimulation by upping the stakes and stimulating further contraction in the spastic muscle. It becomes a cycle that does not resolve. And this reflex arc may persist for months or years, leading to chronically spastic muscles and associated pain. Well, that's the area that I arrived at this information from, being a chronic pain specialist at uh, beginning at Mount Diablo Hospital for four years and then moving to St. Helena Hospital's chronic pain management program for nine years after that. So that accounts for the soma or somatic reflex arc and its influence on chronic contraction of muscles. And while that unveils the mechanism by which central nervous system mediated squeezing and contraction serve to build tension up over time, by itself, it does not account for the entire influence of how tension buildup takes place because it interreacts with another mechanism, the autonomic reflex arc. They are separate mechanisms, but they overlap and interrelate. You can see in the upper left of the screen, the same reflexive arc occurring with sensory information coming in from the outer part of the body in blue, arcing into the center of the spinal cord, and then the motor reflex coming out in red. In the, in the case of the autonomic, it affects organs, the functioning of organs the spleen, the liver, the stomach, the pancreas, all organs are expressed and operate through this mechanism. It's the only mechanism in town, so to speak, inside the body. So the autonomic nervous system operates this network, glands and organs, they connect to different regions in the spinal cord. And the, the action of this mechanism is governed by a fairly simple uh, way of operating through stimulation, 
which is overseen by the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system and then by slowing down. And that takes place through what is referred to as the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. Much like the way that your automobile has an accelerator to speed up and the brakes to slow down. That's exactly how the, this functioning is regulated inside your body. Autonomic reflex arc is the mechanism that provides the motion that operates the organ and glandular networks inside you. Without the autonomic reflex arc, organs would be stagnant and would not move. They would not function. Classically, these two adjoining uh, reflex arcs are geared to operate in unison as a single output system, somatic and autonomic, in harmony. Essentially, the autonomic reflex arc on the left tends to operate connected to the somatic reflex arc on the right. Their output, though separated, takes place synergistically as a unified whole. Essentially, the autonomic reflex arc uh, is separate but distinct from the somatic. And you have the like two gears operating together. They interact with each other, but also operate separately, much like the way these inter acting gears are depicted inside of you. The autonomic reflexes fall under the general category of this, what's called visceral. That essentially pertains to the sensory pathway of the internal organs. A visceral reflex essentially refers to the viscera or the internal organs, specifically within the chest, which is the heart and the lungs, and the abdomen, the liver, pancreas, and intestines. And the interaction of our body's glands with our internal organ system affects the makeup of our inner world in ways that are frequently invisible to us in a figurative sense, our inner, what we feel is something visceral deep down, and we refer to it as a gut feeling. The visceral reflexes travel along the same nerve pathway as the somatic reflex, which is probably why they are so closely aligned to each other, why they are prone to respond as an integrated, reflex system. And this is why the somatic reflex involving the contraction, the squeezing of muscles, in this case, the muscles are in the face, plays a principal role in the expression of emotions. This is where the, the reflex arcs begin to merge into behavioral systems that ultimately make up mental health. Now, how are we doing on time? Good. All right, I'm just going to keep going and you cue me, Anya Maria. Okay.
the reflexive, and remember, it's a reflex. The front part of our brain is not steering it. Taking place along this pathway from the spinal cord along the spinal nerves to the motor neurons. You see the muscle fibers there in that tube-like structure. It stimulates the contracting of those fibers. The nerve impulse going down the nerve body, stimulating the squeezing of the fibers. A review of this schematic reveals the autonomic nervous system controls visceral functions, primarily outside of our awareness. Of course, that helps explain why visceral reflexes tend to take place, of course, underneath our attention. And the reason why the visceral sympathetic reflex tends to function under our radar, so to speak, is because anatomically, this response involves the limbic system, that curved structure you see above the brain stem on the left diagram, and the, which the limbic structure is involved with emotions. And that's different then the seat of our attention, the frontal cortex, does not account for what's happening underneath it. You can see the frontal cortex is highlighted on the right diagram. Its gaze goes outward, and that is the world that it navigates and steers. On the other hand, as the seat of our emotions, the limbic system, can elevate our general level of responsiveness, which adds an element to chronically spastic or hypertonic muscles that can be overlapping with emotional overtones. And that's what's interesting here is that psychologist Jean Piaget, in his theory of cognitive development, it's predicated on the sensory motor stage of development, which he defined as first occurring at birth and continuing for six months. And according to Piaget's construct, during the initial sensory motor stage, the infant is possessed with reflexive, instinctual action and learns that they are separated from their environment. And within five months, the infant attempts to gain some level of influence over their environment. And that takes place through reaching, grasping, trying to bring the outer world in, touching, putting it in their mouth, tasting. On these occasions, on other occasions, when an infant fails to achieve any influence over their immediate environment, they're unable to reach, for example, this can classically trigger a crying response. And the gamut of emotions that the infant experiences can range from non-realization of immediate gratification to frustration, helplessness, despair. At times, even range into feelings of low self-esteem because it didn't get what it was looking for. And this spectrum can range from indignation that you can see expressed through pouting to a full on tantrum, complete with spontaneous and unabashed expression of emotional injury, pain, assault in the form of emotional injury. And while these spontaneous emotional responses are categorized as visceral and the mechanism responsible for synchronizing the emotional output, 
with the muscles involved in their very expression on their face is the integrated autonomic somatic reflex arc. Needless to say, primal based emotions aren't merely limited to feelings of upset. also emerge from fear, apprehension, and although these reflex arcs are, form the basis of the sensory motor stage of cognitive development, as articulated by Jean Piaget, they're additionally involved in the expression of the fight or flight reflex. And as we develop they're the same sensory motor reflexes that form the foundation of the identical level of responses that take place as the years unfold. And even with the passage of time, the mechanisms underlying the sensory motor responses remain essentially unchanged. Even though the impulses are generated Within this limbic system, you see diagrammed in the brain, they become triggered and operate reflexively the same exact way that other reflexes operate. So emotionally based reflexes involve the joint activation of both autonomic and somatic nervous system output together as they interact synergistically. So in summary, the somatic reflexes serve as a primary mechanism that shapes the basic constructs of everyday living, including perceptual awareness. Think back to the light reflex coming in through the eye. The emotional component incorporates visceral impressions that are transmitted autonomically and the visceral autonomic sensory input combined with autonomic somatic motor output to form a unified response channel. These responses provide a bridge from our inner world of perception to the somatic means of expression. And it's no exaggeration at all to appreciate that the range of perception and subsequently the structure of our very cognition is defined by autonomic somatic parameters. And while this mechanism is underlying the sensory motor responses remain structurally unchanged, our foundational responses eventually become more refined as we age and acquire experience. And when reflex arcs become hyperactive, they become default settings that fundamentally shape the manner in which we apprehend our external environment, including perception itself, and we see reflex arcs as the very mechanism involved in expressing trauma, traumatic reflex arcs. And while the pathway of responses remains the same, the potential threat, warning, gradient figures to stimulate doses of adrenaline. as in alarm, fear, and potential physical harm. 
even at a reduced level than a full on battlefield traumatic response, this adrenaline surging can result in it long term as a reflex can result in a generalized short sampling time characteristic of attention deficit disorder, tendency to catastrophize, and a short attention span. Okay, so we see these um, taking place with through emergency and a threats to our dignity. And you can, this is a great example of the changes in light when the sympathetic branch is stimulated, connected with emergency through the pupils in the eyes being enlarged or dilated. This can take place if we feel unjustly criticized, insulted, denigrated, humiliated. It serves to awaken bombardment of adrenaline through the autonomic nervous system as expressed through the somatic nervous system. And when we issues involving social standing, acceptance, ridicule, can be can trigger inside of us just like physical threats to ourselves and to our dignity and you can see it acted out through the expression on the face and when these responses become embedded in our circuitry they become stimulated automatically with almost no provocation they become Autom automatic responses. So about ready to wrap this up. And it, this comes to a head in the following way in terms of behavior. The reflex arcs that re refers to the impulses that travel from the periphery to the spinal cord through these dedicated pathways and the extended value of accounting for these hyperactive reflex arcs lies in the expanded appreciation of how this can serve as a contributing element in behaviors that contain a neurophysiological cycling component. One example of this is generated through anxiety disorders, generalized anxiety, where afflicted individuals can experience resurging levels of excessive adrenaline that never has the opportunity to diminish because the reflexive arcs cycle. Neurochemical cascading, including adrenaline, are also said to be a major factor in depression. And another example of the cycling adrenaline is said to be bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. That is how these reflex arcs generate cycling behaviors that border on mental health. So for those of you who uh, are interested in mental health disorders, hyperactive reflex arcs represent a foundational mechanism that accounts for why repeating psychological behaviors become perpetuated inside. Any, any questions? <clears throat> 